And I'd like to introduce the next session, which is a panel discussion entitled Institutional Elitism, Access in Art and Design Education. And I want to point out that this was uh, proposed by a third-year student on the BA uh, Criticism, Communication, and Curation course, um, Shelley Asquith, who's sitting on the panel. So I'm going to turn over now to Osei Bamsu, who's a second-year student on the same course. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for being here and welcome to Central St. Martins. Um, art schools are often perceived as diverse institutions, but they are fast becoming exclusive and less diverse. In the context of rising fees, frozen grants, fewer students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are applying to art school. The attainment gap for black students like myself is growing, and many are seeing academic institutions as a safer alternative to the huge cuts in the arts that threaten every aspect of our industry. Listening to Kim Howell speak, I was struck how, I was struck by how Kim saw higher education as elitist. Um, it is clear that the struggle has always been a political one. As Kim suggested, the fight is more than about, is a fight more about adequate, more, more than a fight, more than a fight about adequate provision of funding in the art school. It is rather a constant political experiment. From Kim's reflections on political experiments to art institutions throughout history, reflected in the speech by Malcolm Quinn, the exploration, um, or rather his exploration, um, we, we look at these questions within this talk. Um, what can government and institutions do to tackle existing access barriers within the arts? Do you think that the entry requirements for art schools, such as the portfolio as opposed to traditional exams, make them less, less elitist? What role does the media play in terms of how we consider art schools as elite? Um, on our panel, we have Neil Griffiths, um, who is the director of Arts Emergency, um, which is a new uh, national collective of artists, academics, activists, and arts graduates working to create privilege for young people without the privilege and keeping the doors of university open to all. In 2011, he was voted one of the most 50 influ influential speakers, um, most f f fundraisers within the country, um, and has recently launched uh, the Alternative Boy Boys Network, um, a pilot men mentoring scheme with connections um, for, that produces connections for FE students within Hackney. Um, also on our panel, we have Jess Draper. Um, Jess Draper obtained her BA and her MFA of, at the University of Swazulu Natal. Um, in South Africa before coming to Britain to begin reading her PhD at the fine art, in fine art at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art, University of Oxford, Christchurch. Um, she has researched widely on the subject of African art and has formed part of the organizing committee um, for exhibitions such as Powerhouse at the old Ozzy Power Station in Oxford and Insight um, as the modern mode of inquiry at, at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, also on our panel, we have Aisha Richards, who founded Shades of Noir after completing her um, after completing a scoping research titled um, "Any Room at the Inn" in 2009. She is an alumnus of two colleges within the University of the Arts and a lecturer in seven, at several higher education institutions. Um, Shades of Noir is looking to improve the degree of attainment between black and ethnic minority students. She is also a creative practitioner and is the elective chair of GEMS, um, the group for the equality of, the, or, or rather, of GEMS. Um, Shelley Asquith, then finally, who organized this quite brilliantly, um, is the student union's president-elect. Um, having run on a platform of expanding the field of accessibility and quality within the arts, she hopes um, that we build a student union that is more of a visible force within fights against issues that matter to students specifically. Um, these include affordable halls of residence, um, longer library hours, an arts app, bigger bursaries, an arts app for the university, which hopes to benefit students. Um, bigger bursaries and to fight cl cuts, closures, and fees. She has represented UAL at the NUS national and women's conferences um, and fought for the closures, um, fought against the closures of halls. Um, she is also a trade union rep. So, without further ado, I'm uh, and Samuel, of course, who we, di who, we, who, who we didn't know whether he'd he'd be with us. He was slightly late, but we're glad to have him here. Um, 
Samuel is an alumni um, who studied graphic design here at Central St. Martins. Um, he has benefited through the 198 education policy, um, which provides a local resource for the community um, and, arts, uh, and links to art schools and colleges um, and the, with the delivery of national curriculum. Um, the core aim of that program um, is to improve the knowledge ex and experience of contemporary art and, and ultimately to, 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 um, to, to help, I guess, the local residents benefit um, through creative practice um, and integrating them into the arts more broadly. Uh, so without further ado, I will invite Samuel to speak about his experience. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a bit flustered, as you can tell. I just came in like less than five minutes ago. Um, Basically, I've been invited to speak about my experience being a graphic design student at St. St. Mines. I would briefly like to talk about the process that I went through. Um, I joined 198 um, in 2006, I believe, after a friend had recommended me to attend the gallery. She wanted me to do a mural in Brixton, however, that fell through, so she recommended 198 Contemporary Arts and Learning as a place to come and just basically build, up, build upon my skills and experience. Um, so I joined there. After joining there, I got involved in a lot of the projects that was going on and the exhibitions that were happening during the time. And that led me on to speaking at various places like the National Portrait Gallery, the Photographer's Gallery, as well as working alongside them um, and the British Museum, basically. You know, it enabled me to compile a series of um, interviews on the Brixton Riots as well, which featured in their exhibition in 2011. So after that, um, I was doing this whilst I was attending college and going to um, institutes, educational institutes. So I attended um, Eden Hammersmith in West London. And then after that, I went on to LCC, London College of Communication. Um, so after that, I wasn't really too sure whether it was something that I wanted to pursue, whether graphic design was something that was for me. So I decided um, to take a gap year. And during that time, taking a gap year, gave me an opportunity to reflect on whether graphic design was for me. Um, so during that time, I was one of the co-founders of a social enterprise called Hustlebox. And we offer print services as well as clothing and design services for the wider community through a shop situated in Brixton. So that gave me an opportunity to meet Bernie Mac. You know, he's one of the people sitting in the audience. And um, she told me about a short course, Bernie Yates, So. <laughs> So, um, so she told me about a short course happening at Central St. Martins. Um, so I got involved in a short course. And that led me on to going on to do a BA in graphic design. Um, so I had the opportunity of experiencing it both at the old Hold building and then moving on, I believe, in 2011 to this building. So um, that just gave me an opportunity to really gain an insight into what art school was really about. Um, it gave me an opportunity to build upon my experiences as well and pursue graphic design as well as work on the projects that I wanted to work on, as well as build contacts within the industry. You know, we started our puzzle box with the idea that we wanted to be a platform for young people to get their voice out there. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to meet with various people as well as, you know, exhibit our work at Country Show, Brixton Splash, and just work with various people in the arts. And then after um, finishing my degree, I decided to work for a design studio for a short while called Blosh. Um, however, things never worked out. So as a result of that, I decided that I was going to start up my own design company. And um, in October, I decided to do that. And it's been going well ever since. So that's my experience. Hi everyone, thanks Osei for the kind introduction. So I'm Shelley, I'm gonna be the president of the Students' Union here from July. Um, and I'm about to graduate from Central St. Martins, fingers crossed anyway. The idea for this session I came up with about six months ago when there was a call for submissions for what's the point of art school. The idea has really come from my own experiences of having spent three years here, the barriers I've faced and the ones I've seen others like Samuel face. I wanna talk a bit about how this place operates and where I see the wider field of arts education going. Where I see it going, I guess, if we don't resist some of the changes. Now, when I take you back to 1995 to start with, I'm sure you all know the Pulp song with the girl who studied sculpture at St. Martin's College, 
who wanted to live like common people and the rest of it. A great representation of the class system in the art school. Mixing with common people at an art school like this would have been a whole lot easier back then, I imagine, before tuition fees were introduced and then trebled, the latter resulting in the number of students from low-income families applying to arts courses dropping by 25%. Now, if the common people girl from BA Sculpture was here today, I could tell you some things about her. We know that she came from Greece. Well, being a non-UK student means she'd be scoring 26% lower than her home student peers. We also know that she had a thirst for knowledge. But based on our current demographic, there'd be a one in four chance she had dyslexia, and so she may have struggled if she wasn't accessing the available support services. Jarvis told her to cut your hair and get a job. Well, the haircut bit might have been easy, but she'd have a bloody tough time trying to find a job that paid in a climate like this with record youth unemployment. Realistically, she'd probably be being exploited in an unpaid internship. Like the girl in the song, I think some of us do romanticise about the down and out artist who gets through college by squatting and buying paint instead of food. But look around. How grand is this building? It doesn't translate as a place where the next Art of Pavera movement is forming, where the future YBAs are hanging out. It's expensive and clean looking. It has a chip card entry system. CSM is the most rich of our UAL colleges in terms of the socioeconomic background of our students. Speaking in terms of access, I'm an access student, as it were, first in my family to go to uni, and I rinse the university of all the bursaries going. The financial support we offer is quite good, <laughs> I'd know, if you know that it's there, though. And the widening participation programme is fantastic. But actually getting into the university in the first place is another story. I had to drop out in my first week here when I, when I came here. My student loan hadn't arrived in time, and I couldn't pay the rent. I came back, but the National Student Loans Funding System lets many more people slip through the net. The fact that we're, mean, that we're means tested gives poorer students hoops to jump through. And I don't think we can ever say that anything would be a fairer access system than free education with universal grants funded by taxing big businesses and the rich. There are other aspects to student life that can act as a barrier to access. To use UAL as an example again, the cheapest halls of residence available here has risen by 57% in a year. And incredibly expensive housing prices is a particular problem for students in London. The price we're expected to pay for materials is huge too. And if you can't afford the best cameras, fabrics and other equipment, you're at a disadvantage. But access to education isn't just about students' financial situation. Students may decide not to go to an institution if they don't feel it reflects their interests, isn't accommodating their culture. That might mean a lack of disability support, a discriminatory sign-in policy, or a lack of a place to pray if you're religious. As we know, arts is also the worst affected subject area for higher education cuts across the country. We're facing huge cuts to staffing budgets, course closures, and a strain on studio space as our intake goes up to keep ourselves afloat. This strain on contact time favours students who are already suited to independent study and disadvantages those who need extra help. Of course, these cuts are nonsensical in economic terms. For every one pound invested in the arts, another four is generated, and we export 16 billion to the economy. But we also know the cultural value of arts education, that creative skills encourage academic learning and help grow a young person's appreciation of other areas of the curriculum. Other subjects suffer in the absence of the arts. And when we talk about the social value, children who engage in art in school are three times more likely to take a degree and are 20% more likely to vote although not many of them vote in student union elections. Some of these measures are being called for, not just by the government, but by some in this industry. We're having the priorities of some of our university and college management put into perspective, as they'll sooner cut resources than their own salaries. Some vice chancellors at leading unis are now lobbying for us to start paying back our student loans earlier as a way of increasing HE funding. These are, let's remember, the VCs whose salaries on average exceed £300,000 a year. And they think it's us, students graduating in the midst of mass unemployment, shouldering thousands of pounds of debt, who need to be coughing up more money. Some of this stuff seems impossible to be able to resist, especially when it's happening at once and affecting every aspect of the industry. But if we can build a discourse in how we effectively and collectively defend the arts, we have a chance. But this needs to be a discourse that goes outside of this room, outside of our schools, and even builds links internationally. I'm inspired at the moment by two campaigns across the pond where two art schools are currently fighting huge campaigns against attacks on their education. Cooper Union in New York and Capilano in Canada. Capilano is closing 200 courses in total in its arts and textiles departments to counter a deficit. Students and staff have responded by taking fire, hammers and chainsaws to their artwork, destroying it in protest. 
It's concerning, but sadly not surprising, that it's the creative courses the university has decided to get rid of first. And this is no doubt something we could see becoming a trend. Let's be clear though, cuts to the arts ultimately lie with the government. A cabinet whose disregard for the creative sector is very clear. A cabinet who I regard as a bunch of festering maggots, feeding off the poverty of the working classes. Half of them are millionaires and their fortunes are growing at the expense of our livelihoods, our homes and our education. Not one of them has lived in social housing, been unemployed, and few of them have even gone to a comprehensive school. It's a cliche, but they do know the price of everything and the value of nothing. This was only confirmed by Maria Miller's speech a few weeks ago, when she insisted that the art should be seen as a commodity to be bought and sold. Well, shame. Miller and Gove don't want the public to recognise the social value of the arts, but only to emphasise it as something to make money from. This point of view only leads us towards a more aggressive system, a continuation of an unregulated, marketised, neoliberal system leading to an increase in the price of arts education, ultimately a removal of the cap on tuition fees, an end to the state funding by galleries and museums, high entrance fees out of reach to the general public, and would generally make the arts merely a pursuit of the privileged, taken off the curriculum in schools because it's not seen as something you can get a job in. I believe the arts are becoming more elitist, and arts education more inaccessible. But that's why we're here today, appealing to you to fight that and to defend our diversity. If we want to see the arts as an accessible route for anyone, no matter what their background, and I'm sure we all do, then we need to work together as students, teachers and practitioners. We need to be fighting back against dangerous government policy, promoting in the public realm the social value of arts education. And we also need to fight back within our own institutions too, against those who toe this line of marketisation and profit and making the case for free, funded arts education, accessible to all and run as a public service. Thanks for listening. Okay, so good morning and thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction, Asai. Um, as Asai mentioned, um, I'm a South African doctoral student in my third year at the Ruskin in Oxford and uh, my research is currently focused on the ideologies of whiteness and how these might be manifest in South African visual culture. So given this, I spend quite a lot of time theorizing about privilege and access. When I mentioned to my supervisor that I was speaking here today, his response was a sarcastic one. Well, that's great, he said. You can just speak about the seamless transition between your white privileged position in South Africa and the University of Oxford. I mean, aren't the two experiences the same? At first, I laughed at the absurdity of his comment, but for the rest of this day, this transition and the comparison between my two experiences was very much on my mind. Although my initial reflex was to deny that his statements had any validity, this denial became harder and harder to justify. One of the three main points that critical whiteness studies makes is that the construction of a privileged whiteness is as much a social process as an imposition of rules onto a society by a governmental body. Its tropes and mechanisms are therefore so deeply embedded that they exceed any one individual's ability to live outside of these structures. This means that even if a person granted the privilege of whiteness refuses them, they are still at an advantage, even if this advantage is solely that they experience fewer obstacles. The reality in a South African context is that I have always been part of the privileged elite by the very fact of my white skin. This is the social contract of years of separatist ideologies. Even if these were not formally institutionalized in my generation, thank goodness, the hangover continues into the transformative future. I do not mean to imply that I have swanned around in institutions like Oxford my whole life. This in fact could be, couldn't be further from the truth. But that is not, um, but that it is not, it is only in direct comparison to each other that the differences between these two experiences become clear. That is, when the comparison is limited to the respects of local communities, the similarities, not the differences, are emphasized. In South Africa, I had access to experiences and opportunities that others did not, which I suppose in many ways echoes my experience so far as a member of Oxford University, where I learned very quickly that this affiliation does come with a certain built-in leverage. Even though my experience of privilege in South Africa was not a result of formal separatism, 
the years of unequal power relations and segregational education meant that even though university entrance was at least supposedly based on merit and, and affirmative action, action policies were in play, many people of tertiary age had not had access to quality school education, meaning that even such, if such students gained entrance to tertiary institutions, they could not always perform at the same level as their peers because their foundation education had not been as vigorous, or in some cases had been conducted in a completely different language. During the years of apartheid in South Africa, white privilege related strongly to this availability of formal training and education, which those classified as non-white by apartheid race distinctions were denied. Among the very limited tertiary training establishments available to black South Africans were community art centers, where the emphasis was on producing work that could be categorized as craft according to the then strict separation between the former and high art, ironically yet another division uh, used to govern cultural access. So these community art centers therefore became important edu educational resources for transformation. Peffer explains that the 1950s and the 1960s were a kind of golden era for the South African art scene. Even though political pressure and separatism had begun to increase, the art community remained one of the few places where cross-cultural interactions continued. In this way, even though education in South Africa has historically contributed to oppression, art education has functioned quite differently by contributing to empowerment. Here in the UK, art education has functioned similarly in some ways as an integrated space that is less governed by social binaries. In the post-war climate, those who would not have considered um, university as an option because of financial constraints often could get grants to study at art schools. And in this way, art schools provided broader access to higher education. Um, that's from Le Gris 2011. During the same period, American soldiers who had, served in Korean, who had served in the Korean War were given grants to study in Europe at particular government approved establishments. Again, one of which was the Ruskin School, which was the grandfather to what is now the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art. In this way, one could say that art institutions provided access and opportunities for those who were outside of the academic elite. Art itself has also variously throughout history been instrumental in social change. Here, the obvious examples are the South African resistance art movement that played a profound part in the anti-apartheid struggle and the protest posters, perhaps, of the anarchic protest workshop in London that act as a, acted as a public voice of civil dissent on everything from the Vietnam War to local industrial working conditions in the late 60s. And this was, of course, before the advent of social networking. If art is something that we do, as argued by De Sinaike in 2011, and if this action is to make special, that is, to artify, then it follows that what artifiers choose to make special indicates value, resulting in the production of what she calls great good things. She argues further that these great good things are, in the ethological sense, used to indicate status or importance. So if the purpose of art school is to train people to produce great good things, then surely limiting access to these institutions to the lucky elite results in a narrow display of what society cares about, giving voice to only a few and reinforcing social class binaries. Of course, it is also true that not going to art school does not exclude or prevent someone from artifying, from making art. So then, what's the point in art school? To bring a little pedag pedagogical theory into play, those who do not attend art school are not inducted into the idiosyncrasies of what North Edge might call a wider discursive artistic community. The insider knowledge that allows students to function in these specialist communities goes beyond simple vocabulary to include a general knowledge that is both contextual and theoretical, encompassing prior vocabulary, uh, sorry, encompassing prior experience of the debate, debates and conventions of that particular professional community. Tertiary educators have the ability to initiate this intersubjectivity by modeling the required behavior and allowing students to listen to a practicing professional engaging in specialist discourse. They are then invited to mimic the display and thus become initiated into the specialist discourse themselves. This is perhaps particularly evident in the art world as the ability to negotiate the in-speak and practice dialogue successfully can make an artist more desirable to a community of buyers and sellers attempting to indicate their impeccable taste and knowledge through art. Morney points out that there exists a mythological binary between the university of the past and the university of the present. Namely that, quote, pre-20th century university in the, the pre-20th century university in the global north was associated with elitism, exclusion, and inequalities, 
end quote, and that the international pressure to broaden participa participation implies that the university of today should have adjusted these values, but has it? Morley argues that this, again, quote, diversified, expanded, globalized, internationalized, borderless, edgeless, marketized, technologized, and neoliberalized institution, end quote, is a myth. As such, an unrelenting focus on globalization and modernity means that what is an apparent ethos of transformation is in fact a public and administrative performance that is masking and not changing the university of the past, and thus allowing the continuation of practices which Morley calls archaic. Legree's 2013 argues that because most art schools are now aligned with wider universities, art educators have had to assimilate into the research funding and funding process and begin defining, defining themselves and their practice in the universal terms of other disciplines, usually beginning with a clear research question and resulting in some kind of identifiable outcome. <laughs> Rising fees and decreasing national funding means that this ability to package oneself and one's practice attractively for funding bodies is becoming more necessary than ever. Students are incurring, incurring major lasting debt, which Legris predicts will, quote, seriously discourage poorer students, inhibit art schools from taking risks, and strengthen academic conservatism. In this context, he says, an anti-academic attitude still has value. It remains necessary to protect, to protect the unpredictability and idiosyncrasy essential to arts creative, creativity against conservative educational models, end quote. In his study of the French class system, Bourdieu points out that the certification of knowledge and culture, such as those offered by institutions like universities, provides an ideal platform for the elite to maintain its privilege. So it follows that broadening the base of the certification might undermine elitism of this kind. Furthermore, one advantage of the university link is that it could provide the analytical tools to identify and critique the invisible tentacles of elitism, thus allowing for the possibility of change. Gilman explains how art can either facilitate the expression of trauma through providing a platform for exploration or facilitate repression. Monuments may serve to honor a particular memory of a culture, but art allows for the exploration of more than one truth, of more than one perspective. Art thus has the ability to be more than just a place for present dilemmas, but extend to pursuing the memories of the past and the possibilities of the future. Perhaps this means that art institutions are uniquely positioned to begin the slow task of realizing Morley's University of the Future, effecting deep and meaningful change rather than the performance of change. After all, art and its institutions have proven on more than one occasion and in more than one context that they can be powerful portals of change. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say pretty much what everyone said, um, <laughs> less eloquently and with a more anti-academic take. Um, so I founded the Arts Emergency Service in 2011, although we've only been operating for five months as a charitable service. I'm just going to outline the kind of issues that we saw as activists, comedians, performers, writers, as a group of people that came together kind of 10 years older than, than current FE students going to uni. Um, so I'm going to read it in quite a monotone fashion. Um, <laughs> what I'd like you all to do is just take notes and send the best quotes back to me. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to begin by quoting one of the principals from our first partner college, which is in Clapton in Hackney, which is B6. I'm sure a lot of you that work in wider than participation know those guys. They do a lot of great stuff, and they've got a big team working around access. Um, Ken sent me a letter, a lovely letter at the end of last year to talk about what we were doing um, and he outlined in really succinct fashion, and I'll expand on it, um, <coughs> the kind of problems that we're facing. Um, so really, um, I'll just begin by putting my glasses on. Uh, the pressure of university tuition fees and an escalating premium on top jobs means that our students will be tempted to play safe. It is likely that they will opt out of apparently uh, opt for apparently useful or more work-related degrees. As our students are often from families with no history of higher education, there is no countervailing pressure at home. And that was our starting point in developing the Arts Emergency Service and the Alternative Old Boy Network, which is 
kind of integral to what we're doing now. Um, deliberately called it Alternate Fog Boys to be subtly provocative and also the students with which we work understand what it means when you say it's who you know and we just try to, to flip it into a more positive kind of uh, proactive sense. Um, so with the abol abolition of the education maintenance allowance, which was a vicious attack on the aspirations of young people in some of the poorest parts of society, and the raising of the bar to £9,000 a year in so many of our universities, I genuinely do not think it's hyperbole to say that nothing less than a national fight for the working class ability to think critically is underway. It's vital that we ensure the arts do not become seen as a luxury for those that are free from the kind of pressures and material, structural and cultural disadvantage that a lot of us have touched on already, and I won't expand on too much, because um, I think we all kind of, there's an elephant in the room with disadvantage. It's been going on a long time. <laughs> it didn't start with the coalition in 2010. Um, so in addition now, however, to the huge debt uh, that undergraduates are taking on, there's the existing issues of negativity from peers, um, so coming from a very working class area, I had a lot of, I studied English and it took me a long time to be comfortable with that, that, that you know, rather non-practical, non-real world um, subject. There are employability issues now, especially when you look at statistics for unemployment in people under 24 and, and frankly people of my age at 31, it's not easy either um, now when we've all got that. There are existing prejudice and stereotypes to overcome. There's a, a vague but stymieing idea of what's useful in the like, quote-unquote real world. Um, there's a pre-extant attainment gap between people of different class, ethnicity and gender that's a result of centuries of inequality. And it's a really toxic mix of pressure and considerations to heap upon young people along with the debt at a really critical point in their life. So there's a difficult choice to be made. So expanding on what Ken says, there's, there's a lot of aspects here. It's not that we're having all the answers as an organisation. It's not that any one institution can address it, it's a societal issue. Um, and in terms of education, there's a dominant value system which really appears as if it's completely geared towards short-term profit, geared towards the needs of industry. That, the means, um, that means that the teaching grant for arts and humanities is obviously abolished now for 100%, and that cost has been passed on to students. Um, arts, and, arts and design are sidelined in secondary education. And in a market dynamic of supply and demand, these subjects become very vulnerable because, frankly, a lot of people from different backgrounds are going to opt against studying such subjects. I mean, I studied English, but I initially started doing a law degree and I dropped out after about three months because it wasn't right. And if that was now, if that was eight years hence and, and I did it now, I'd have left university for good and I had to work in a warehouse for two years before I went. I can't imagine what it's like for an 18-year-old now. Um, so, simply put, the subjects that we consider the arts, which would be not just arts institutions, but liberal arts in the sense of any pursuit that is sort of liberated from its social context, um, history, philosophy, literature, anything really like that. Um, oh, I've lost my place. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so these subjects we consider the arts, are, they're appropriate for some people, not for others. And it's something you heard all throughout New Labour, that the 50% target for university attendance was excessive, it was inappropriate because university just isn't for everybody, um, would the kids from the estates even enjoy it, shouldn't they just be doing apprenticeships, uh, you know, that's good old fashioned prejudice and snobbery and, you know, that's something that people in power still suffer from today. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, we live in a country where politics, media and many key professions are largely dominated by public school alumni. Uh, I recently heard the current coalition front bench is described as a chumocracy, um, which was, that's uh, Eric Pickles saying that as well. So, I mean, there's a real issue there, isn't there? I, I went to a, a recent academic uh, think tank and there were two women in the room both of which, one was a dame and one was a bishop, I believe. <laughs> and the dame at the end of that talk, and I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, the dame at the end of that talk had to stand up and make the point that no woman had spoken. So a dame was in a room with, with VCs and all sorts of people and felt discriminated against. So there's a problem here that, you know, it's quite prof profound. Um, but yeah, chumocracy, back to what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we live in a society with vast and myriad inequalities of wealth. Opportunity and knowledge are limited for a lot of people and access to ed education 
all across the intersectional spectrum of what I would say is like non-establishment people is, is huge. Um, and when that happens, the kind of public discourse you have, the kind of popular culture output, uh, popular culture being really where everyone learns about other people, which is a really important thing, uh, that becomes narrowed, and that's really dangerous. This is why we decided to address the issue in access to arts, because we felt that voice is really important. I'm sure everyone would agree. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a dynamic now where vast swathes of the population are being sort of incentivized to disengage from studying the human condition in one form or another. Uh, we think it's a basic right to do so. Um, any education should, and I wouldn't go so far as to say should be rooted in that and that alone, but it should certainly take account of this need to study the human condition in more than a superficial way. It would be really difficult to argue that the education system shouldn't produce people that are useful to society. So what you're really talking about is what sort of society do you want? Is there an alien coming? <laughs> <coughs> wow, <laughs> that's beautiful. So we're really talking about what kind of society we want. And if we don't value the arts, you know, it's a very dystopian situation we're heading into, I think. Um, that, that's a key question. You know, I think in terms of institution by institution, it's fine. Widening participation, social mobility, the brilliant terms for inequality, you know, really. Um, so we're just trying to be the anti-academic kind of bleeding heart, people doing something about it in a practical sense. Um, so, I mean, the, the basic issue is that we have a government and we've covered the festering maggot stuff, which I, I edited this talk three times. Um, and I, t I was very neutral, so I'm, I'm glad that was said because I'm not in a position to say it now. We're, we're good, official charity and stuff, um, but we have a government where nearly 50% of those those cabinet ministers have BA degrees, which they didn't pay for, and effectively they're screwing it up for everybody else because they've tripled the cost from when I even went, and my debt still stands at 16 grand, and you know that's no small fright. The interest is not inconsiderable. The more I earn, the more it takes, and. Having quit my job to run arts emergency, being unpaid, I'm just watching it top up now every time I get a statement. It's not great. It's a, it's a yoke around your neck you know, in, in every sense. Um, and the government are kind of emphasizing the fact that for some people, culture is a luxury that they can afford. And we want to count that by saying it's something everyone should do. And it's something you don't even need an institution to do, to engage in culture and critical thought. Um, these institutions that we're in today, they exist to shore that up, to take it further, to, to value it. Um, but it's not necessarily the only way. Uh, it's not apathy that leads to disengagement with education. Uh, the students we meet uh, throughout Hackney Borough have millions of things they want to do. They're all bright, optimistic, positive, keen and smart. But all of them, from various backgrounds, have a lack of opportunity to explore their options properly. They have a heavy hand being laid on their enthusiasm, and that could be through dismal politics, that could be through all the issues that we've covered today. Um, but there's a lot of pressures going on. Uh, and a lot of them are stopping before they even really pursue what they want to do. They're opting to, so you might have one student that wants to be a sociologist. If you haven't got familial support and you've got to justify that decision and that debt to your family, it doesn't matter what the institution's doing. Fundamentally, the first point of call is to to, to be confident in going into an unknown world. And a lot of them aren't. I wouldn't have done either. You know, I can say, just from a personal conjecture point of view, I would not have engaged in the arts at all. Um, a lot of people wouldn't. So it's quite a big issue, and it's not just down to the institutions to address it, um, really. Although, obviously, it starts here, and everyone can talk in much more detail about contextual data and all the different ways of, of widening access. But I think there's a social problem at heart here. Um, so I just want to quote some of our patrons and tell you a bit about what we're doing. So I'll be more articulate in that sense. Um, so to quote uh, the comedian Stuart Lee, um, the very people being deterred by these costs are the sort of independent minds we used to value as a society. The same people now demonstrably priced out of further education. It's another example of the erosion of access, the reversal of social mobility, the entrenchment of privilege, and the gradual silencing of diverse voices. Um, the arts in education produces great citizens. They come out and they might specialise in something that seems obscure and not even obliquely related to everyday life, but arts graduates are able to use these skills in various social situations, various work environments. It, it, it creates citizenship. Um, they're really valuable citizens to have for a certain kind of society, uh, especially a democracy where expression and critical thought should be 
the most highly valued skills in, in anybody from any walk of life. Um, you might ask whether or not we live in a society that requires many people like that or wants many people like that. And if you consider that question and decide that it doesn't, then you might want to ask where we're going, broadly speaking. Um, so it feels as though at the moment we're looking at two different issues from the outside, and it's this kind of anti-academic approach to the issue. Um, we've got the, the different value systems in education and society at large, which would be, I would describe as utilitarianism versus a more humane liberal education. Um, one approach obviously treats the human being as an end, the other treats it as a means, and it just seems that treating students as a means to an end now is, is much more prevalent. Um, and you see this in the way we justify higher education generally in terms of economics. You see that humani humanity itself is really judged on its use value, as you can see what happened in Bangladesh a few weeks ago. It's not just about the institutions where we educate citizens, it's, it's a, a value system that runs throughout society that I think it resonates, this issue resonates for me as an activist, political activist, through everything I've ever worked on over the last 10 years. Um, so these are like really big things to talk about when really what we're doing, and I'll explain this in my last little bit, is connecting students that have an interest with ways of pursuing and finding out more about those interests. Um, and I use interest deliberately because it's not just that they particularly want to do an arts degree. Some of them want to become musicians or practicing writers straight away or artists that, that don't feel they need the training. And we're not there to marketize their, their dreams, um, frankly. But we're starting at that level because that's where we think the change can happen. Um, it's the individual subjective level. And we don't want to do the work for young people. We don't want to put them in a position where they're simply given an opportunity without working for it. We want to it's really subjective. We want to make them feel just as entitled as anybody else to do what they want to do. Because if they feel just as entitled, they're much more likely to succeed. And if they have inside information, they're much more likely to succeed. Um, so specifically what Arts Emergency wants to do, I'll quote another patron, all of which like, are much more articulate than me. Like, I founded it with Josie Long, who's a comedian. This is usually her job, so I apologize that there's not so many laughs. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what we want to do is, uh, so I'll quote Jake Chapman. So we've got Jake and Dina signed up. We're going to do work experience with them. Um, this is all very quiet. We're not pressing this at all. We're simply replicating the old boy network for people that aren't old boys. Um, so he describes what we're doing in the most concise fashion, and that's creating privilege for people without privilege that people with privilege cannot have. Um, which I like because it's provocative, but it's all, it really explains what we're, we're about. Um, so as such, we've literally sought to replicate the benefits of a network of entrenched privilege. Uh, so the alternative our boys network already has over 200 contacts working in TV, film, music, art, academia, law, campaigning, activism, comedy, journalism, publishing, fashion, design. We've got scientists in there. We've got, I mean, pretty much every job. Or if anyone's a games designer, we need some games designers because we've got students interested in that. But pretty much, it's a vast spectrum of people from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of professions. Um, not all academic, but primarily a lot of the students are going to university, so we're looking to give them that kind of critical presence as they make the transition. Um, at the heart of that network is a pilot mentoring program, which we're running in Hackney through eight colleges. Uh, we currently have 42 students and mentors. Um, which is quite large, considering we've spent 350 quid putting this together over the last two years. Um, but it's really working well. So we're working with further education students, 16 to 19, in non-selective institutions that just need a bit of a confidence, a bit of connections, and to feel be that they belong in these worlds that, that a lot of us take for granted. So, you know, it's really easy to underestimate the... the the intangible elements of this. So any widening participation program and, and attempt to address inequality in an institution always operates within its own context. And what we're trying to do is put the emphasis on the young people to just give them the opportunities and let them deal with everything you kind of present them with as institutions. Um, it's so oh, just to summarize, it's uh, help we get when we need that bit of support and direction to be able to do the things we want to do. Um, and that's what we at Arts Emergency have created. It's a very open collective of people who want to share some privilege and give back confidence to the next generation. Um, so we really, we're, we're quite small. I mean, we're quite big for considering it's just me that runs it. Um, but, you know, we're, we're hoping eventually to empower as many young people as possible and go nationwide. So we do have volunteers in Manchester and Newcastle and Edinburgh and Wales and Birmingham and 
Sweden and America and France as well, which is quite exciting. Um, but I, there's no way I can do anything with them at the moment, but it's nice to have that, that kind of interest. I think we've touched on a really good idea. There's a good kernel at the heart of this idea. Um, and it's, yeah, it's working really well. And we're, we're, we're countering issues in academia. We're countering structural disadvantage. We're, we're looking at social issues. We're also kind of against that X Factor style aspiration where everything's so awful the young people want to take an abstract parachute jump out of their own existence and kind of, and they, that's horrendous. So although we've got like celebrity people involved, it's, it's really important that what we have happen is that they learn, you want to be an artist, well, okay, this is how you get a part-time job and this is how you work. On top of that, you want to write a book, well, this is how you hold down an office job and get up three hours later. It's not about going, oh, here's Jake Chapman or Josie or anyone like that. Uh, we've had one student go, um, Kate Nash, she's like a pop star. So, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up. But, yeah, it's, it's working really well. Um, I really hope you all uh, sign up, and there'll, there'll be flyers I'll be giving out. And I'm sorry I've waffled and been rangy, but it's a really obvious idea. It's hard to squeeze a lot of words out of it at the end of the day. Oh, and I brought a brick, which you can look at later, just to contemplate. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody, there's quite a lot to take in I guess today, there's not much left to say I think. Um, I didn't know what everybody was going to say so they've covered quite a lot of what I was going to say today. However, I guess the first point is unpacking what elitism is or means or could mean. Um, as I so kindly introduced me, I am an academic, I've been teaching at St Martin's here um, and other institutions for over 10 years. Um, I am alumni to this institution, so I guess I'm a product of this environment. Uh, I currently teach at MA level, as well as teaching teachers on the SILTAD course for, um, what's it called? I can't remember. APP, an acronym that means something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a picture of my daughter. And this is what inspires me to continue to work in equality and push forward the ideals of inclusive practice. Now, I know some of the people here today have talked about inequality, diversity, inclusion. But for me, this is the heart of it all. My daughter, who is second generation black British, comes from a family that love, care and pretty much do everything they can to support her development. The question is, will she ever have the opportunity to be vice chancellor at an institution like this? Is that ever going to be a possibility? I was gonna talk about, um, you know, the kind of makeup of all of our institutions or organizations that we work at. And I was gonna post some pictures of the leads, the vice chancellors, the pro-vice chancellors. But then I thought, we all know what, what that looks like. You know, it's stuff we already know. I was gonna talk about the lack of professionals um, in, the, in the industry, um, representing diverse communities. But again, it's stuff we already know. I was gonna talk about the growing economies and the fact that the top 10 are not in Europe. But again, it's information that we know already. So I thought I'd talk about me. <laughs> Those of you that know me, I don't know if you really know me. <laughs> I am the first generation of black British in my family. My grandparents came over here after serving in the war and came through Windrush in the 1950s. They came here as mechanics, nurses and carpenters. My parents, sought the opportunity, went to grammar school. And my father is an engineer. And my mother is actually <coughs> one of the first black female investment bankers. Do not hold that against her, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, I spoke to her about what I was doing today. And she said to me, oh, you have to tell this story. Again, don't hold this against me. I was five years old and my mum said to me, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, 
Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> bear with me, bear with me. <laughs> she obviously was quite devastated. <laughs> and she asked me why. And I said, she is a powerful woman. She controls the country. She can do whatever she wants. And I want to be just like her. My mum put her hand on my shoulder and said, that may be very difficult. And I said, why? Why? I don't understand. And she said, well, times are changing. There is a possibility. But life is difficult because, to a certain extent, we're new in this country. And then she had the conversation with me. The conversation which meant that I became aware of my colour. I became aware of also my privilege. My privilege in that I am supported constantly by my family and friends, that I have a diverse relationship with a variety of people from all over the world. And I do believe I can do anything. I, don't, I, mean, I can, you know. This is what I say to my students. You can do anything. And the only thing you have to keep in your mind is if you do nothing, nothing ever changes. So, I'm going to keep this short. What is the prospect for this child here? She goes to galleries. As you can see, this is outside this building here. When she was running through those sprinklers, she had an audience of academics. And she felt free. She looked free. But my fear is that if something doesn't change, that won't continue. Thank you. All right. So at this point, we're going to detach our minds from our well-written speeches um, and actually throw the questions out to the audience, because you always know better. So, um, yeah, should I hand this mic to anyone who needs it? I mean, show of hands. We're going to take three in a row, so if we can get the first three questions in there. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a rather simple question, but I'd just be interested in one thing that um, you would like to see happen at this place, at CSM or UA, UAL, to make it more representative? I guess I'm going to have to answer that because I'm the one with the mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I understand um, from what I've gathered, they're cutting the funding to widen participation, um, which is a disappointment to hear because it's enabled a lot of people from various backgrounds that never had the opportunity of going to establishments like CSM not to have that privilege anymore. So for me, it would be extending that and trying to basically bring more people from various backgrounds and giving them that opportunity to come to CSM or places like CSM. Um, well, mine, mine's kind of obvious. Um, don't charge fees. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I have to second both of them. I'm not sure that I... Maybe you have got something... Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think my perspective, both as an academic and alumni to this college too, um, I think the most prevalent thing that I would like to see change is diversity in the staffing. Um, and when I say diversity in the staffing, I mean the academic staffing, the senior management. Not to say that you all aren't doing fantastic jobs. You know, I, I do completely and utterly value the, you know, the contribution, but at the same time, if we don't make some positive, possibly to some extent, people might say it's risky. I don't personally think it's risky. But if we don't make some physical, visible changes, I don't see where we go from here, really. I have to agree with all those as well. I mean, is it one thing that's a feasible change or, uh, or not? Cause a feasible change. Well, 
I mean, if it's not, then obviously uh, get rid of fees completely, um, rehash the, the funding system. Um, but as Ayesha said, like an institutional change needs to happen um, in terms of, of, of how this university is run, I think. Um, and perhaps a feasible change would be um, more funding towards materials costs so that students can actually afford to, to study the courses that they do um, and aren't let down if they don't have loads of money to throw on fabrics and, and equipment. And our next question, we're actually trying to take three in a row, so can we have two questions from the audience? I show you how. Okay, yeah. Uh, Bernie Mac here, a.k.a. <laughs> Bernie Yates. Um, <laughs> it's a question for you, actually, Sam. I know you told us how fantastically your entrepreneurial skills and how you built up your business. What I'd like to know is how your journey was through your degree here in, in graphics communication. And, and as Shelley spoke about the barriers, I didn't actually hear you talk about any barriers when you were here. Everything that you said seemed to be fairly positive. So I think it'd be interesting for us to know if there were any barriers uh, uh, and what they were, and perhaps if you did have any support, how the support worked. Thank you. Okay, and another question. Hi, uh, I'm from Bradford College in West Yorkshire. Um, I was very interested in some of the comments that came and the ways that the widening participation agenda had actually enabled black and Asian students to come into Central and St. Martins and other institutions of this type. Um, in our college, we have, um, we have a large South Asian community. We also have a black community. The white population is very deprived and very poor. Um, and out of the, the general institutional profile is 50% black and Asian, 50% white. However, in the School of Arts and Media, it's 25%. And I would guess the majority of those are probably female and probably come into areas like fashion and, to a certain extent, textiles. What can we do to persuade black and Asian parents and poor white parents that um, arts education is a very viable means and a very important contribution to both the economy and the country and get help those students to come into um, arts education. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Sam and then Aisha. <laughs> okay, um, to briefly address the first question, um, Sorry, the second question, should I say? <laughs> I would say um, raise more awareness through the organizations that deal firsthand with um, young people in deprived areas or young people that are not necessarily able to access the arts. Um, so, for instance, 198, CSM have a partnership with 198, hence how I met Bernie Yates. I think if they continue to build upon that and access different organizations that work firsthand with young people, then it will be able to raise awareness and get more people into organizations like CSM, or institutions like CSM, should I say. Um, Bernie, um, to be honest, there was a number of different challenges. Um, one of them being financially, you know, the, obviously the distance, having to travel from my house to CSM. Um, but there's none that really actually stand out in my mind other than that. You know, um, it was a great opportunity, it was a great experience enabled me to connect with various people from various backgrounds. And to be honest, I believe that's one of the reasons why it's important for us to go to art school. Not only just the education and the opportunities to build upon your skills, but to actually connect with people that you may not have met otherwise. You know, for me, um, I met great friends, you know, people that I'm still in contact with, people that I've had the opportunity of collaborating with since leaving CSM. Um, so other than that, I can't really see there being much challenges. Um, I did find the move and the transition from the old building in Holborn to King's Cross a bit of a difficult time because, you know, moving, um, we had so much freedom in our old building, but moving to this building, we couldn't access various other places. So we couldn't go to um, people in places, different courses, for instance, you know, without our card. We could only um, access the areas that related to our course. Now, I thought that was quite you know, a foolish decision to make because the, the, yeah, some of the prestige of being in the old building was the fact that we got to interact with people from various courses and the fact that they had now moved to a different building and denied access to various places. 
didn't give us that same opportunity anymore. So I guess that's a challenge in itself. I guess I'll only answer the second question. <laughs> um, I think that there's, there's a few things that could, could help. I mean, ultimately, there is no situation or country or institution, either here or abroad, that has solved equality issues. You know, that, that we have to all be mindful of. Um, nobody has done that. However, there are certain things through research that is recommended um, to reduce the, the integration of different communities, to encourage worth of particular communities. Again, you know, I, I can't stress enough the fact that there is so few black academics, so few black professors in this country as being a very poignant piece of information that has to shift. Ultimately, the, the shift of having more females, particularly white females, um, being heads of department, course directors, uh, senior management, has shifted the way higher education is today. So again, in order for it to shift further for equality of race, there has to be some physical changes. Um, th that's my personal opinion. This is uh, partly related to the second question, that I think that um, my children go to a comprehensive school in West London, and things are changing at school now where they are directing children at an earlier age, 13, 12, 13, onto BTEC courses if they feel they're not keeping up with work. And for these schools, as, as the situation stands at the moment, of course, they're being judged on um, exam passes, grades, and so on. So they would rather the kids who are having a harder time go straight through BTEC and get good BTECs mm -hmm. rather than get bad GCSEs. So for in terms, and of course, a lot of those children, the ones who maybe come from more difficult backgrounds where they're not being, you know, things are harder for them, tougher, they're not concentrating as hard, things that with uh, teaching they could do better at, and actually my kids' school is a brilliant school, so I'm not saying it against the teacher, I'm just saying it's easier for the structure of the school to pass them through BTECs. Going to university is, get, is obviously about grades, GCSEs, AS levels, and they are being redirected at a much earlier age. So to get a lot of those black and Asian kids, I think you need to get right in there, into the schools, the colleges, the industry needs to get into the schools a lot earlier, 11, 12, and give them a reason to head in that direction at an earlier stage. Sorry, that's just personal. It's not even a question. Just one more. <laughs> personal experience. Um, my, my question is more, is it Jen? Is that right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's Jess. My question is more for Jess, but maybe other people can touch on it as well. You mentioned how um, there's a mythology of the university becoming global, techno, and neoliberalized. Um, uh, but really, it's like the packaging has changed. But the, the the core you said is this archaic. What what type of th what makes this archaic? What is what is uh, um, can can you put try and put a pin on it? What is it that makes the system what it is today? Uh, so that we can work out how to unpick it, unravel it, and and form it into something new. So perhaps um, the first question, which any of you can answer, um, bringing institutions into schools, etc. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, just about the grading system, I think that's a fundamental flaw in the fact that we have we are grading children at such a young age. Um, it feeds into this this marketised education where schools are competing against each other to get a certain number of A to C grades at GCSE and A level, and it it limits the choices that young people can make. I wonder if it's something maybe Neil and Arts Emergency would consider doing, going into schools at, at an earlier age, um, not when not in sixth form, but um, but yeah, talking about. When, when children are starting secondary school? Well, actually, yeah. On, on that point, um, every teenager we meet, so we've, we've arbitrarily started at, with people that are 16 to 19. It was a good starting point because that seemed to be where the most cogent pressure was. Every single one of them, regardless of background and class, ethnicity, everything like that, they all write poetry and they all engage 
with culture and arts and expression, and they all articulate really well where they, where, where they want to go and what they want to do. So that I think the issues really it is with the institutions. It's not with the people not engaging, regardless of background. I think, you know, I went to a comprehensive school which was probably 50-50 in terms of white and Asian students. And everyone, we were all just pupils and we all got on together. And, and it's almost like the institutions create these, these, these differences and create these barriers, not deliberately, but just by virtue of operating within a context mm. which we've touched on in terms of value systems and, and, and you know. through here and there have been many, many students from you know diverse backgrounds who've survived here and done well and flourished. But how do we make those stories available to those who don't know them? I don't have the answer to that question, but I think that's one of the places we might begin. Well I'll just respond to that briefly. Um, obviously Arts Emergency is an independent organization so we're not affiliated to any institution but we have over 250 volunteers at point of application all those volunteers fill out a personal statement which we are, uh, in which we ask them to explore and analyse their own path to where they got to. So I hope that once we are uh, into the thousands of volunteers, we're going to have an Everest of testimony and different case studies which people can access openly on the internet and find positive role models, positive paths, and kind of demystify all these institutions that are you know, foreign to a lot of us from different backgrounds. So. Um, as widening participation in central St Martins we are doing this work we are working with schools my colleague Ian from the centre UAL is working with schools there is this work going on in the ground I think it just needs to be taken slightly higher so that perhaps our head of college and deans know the kind of work we're doing and can work with us because it's a little bit isolated most of the, the students that progress from the WP stuff that we do, the progression stuff, are BTEC students, and there's nothing wrong with those BTECs. Mm -hmm. It's more, um, it has to be in, 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 in the, the knowledge and the vision of the institution here yeah. to be prepared to see those students and to see the, um, um, the ability of those students that might manifest itself in a slightly different way and in a slightly different language but we take many, many students from BTEX and we work with them all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're extremely short for time, so that will be our last question, although it was more of a statement. I'd like to throw it back to the panel and basically give them a chance to summarize exactly maybe what the audience has been saying, but also the kind of general consensus or what, what the point of art school is for you, perhaps, would be a useful mm -hmm. definition. Um, I've briefly touched upon what I believe the point of art school is, you know, just basically um, interacting with people you may not necessarily have interacted with, the collaborations that you can form, um, and yeah, just basically developing the skills that you already have. Um, I don't believe that um, qualifications is a true reflection of the skills that we can gain from going to institutions like CSM, because we know that people like Neville Brody have gone on to do extremely well despite leaving art school with um, not very well grades. Um, so I believe that you know, we should continue to build upon the relationships that we can form by going to institutions like CSM. Um, I would like to touch upon the last question as well that was raised. Um, basically, sorry, I kind of lost track. What was the question again? <laughs> Okay then, um, yeah, I believe, yeah, just continue to build upon the relationships that we have with organizations that we work with, um, like Kwanane, I believe developing a mentorship scheme as well, 
where you're getting case people that have gone on to do well from the arts, interacting with people that attend art school or people that attend these organizations and just giving them an insight into what you can gain from going to art school and moving on to work and do well in your career, basically. Um, I believe like organizations like C, are, um, that work with CSM, that are part of CSM, are featuring case studies on their website. But I believe that you know we should um, do mentorship schemes, yeah. Just get young people to go out to different organizations and just basically tell them about their experience in the arts and what they've gained from it, and then try to get more people in that way. Uh, I think the arts give people a voice that are perhaps excluded from politics and other walks of life. And I think that means there's a special pressure on art schools to overinvest in access and participation to ensure that those voices are heard. Because if you treat art, liberal arts, all those processes as, as processes of renewal, I think that's where change can start in the expression of issues and everyone's understanding their own context. So I think there's a special pressure on art schools to look at access. Um, because it's so important that we can all express where we are. So. Um, just to respond very quickly to uh, the question from the gentleman in front, um, which kind of, I suppose, does sum up uh, what I think about art school and, and its importance, um, and institutional elitism in general, I suppose. But basically, I think it's, it's quite clear from a lot of the questions and, and from what everyone on the panel was saying that um, change, and by that I mean deep change, so change from the lowest level to the highest level, is an incredibly slow and infinitely slow process, I think. Um, and I think it can be incredibly frustrating when you're not seeing any visible changes. Um, it doesn't always mean that they're not underway. But I think one way to make sure that these changes are, you know, starting to, the cogs are turning and things are moving on, is to keep alive this, um, this kind of self-reflexive environment where you're continually analyzing yourself, you're analyzing other departments. Um, and, and I think that one thing that the whiteness studies anyway does um, talk about a lot is the idea that the only way really to subvert things is through exposure. And I think that that um, remains true and should be you know, what we continue to, to look at. Um, so forums like this are, are really great and really important. So I think it's been great to, to be able to be here and, and and be part of it. So thanks for that. Um, I'm going to do my plug now. Um, Shades of Noir, I didn't actually get to speak about it. Uh, so if you want to find out more, please go to www.shadesofnoir.org.uk or follow us on Twitter, hashtag Shades of Noir. Um, it is a program of resources, activities, um, all sorts of things, um, really, that are there to support the, visible, the visibility of the minority groups that have contributed globally to the creative sector. So if you're teachers, you can use it, find resources, you can find potential um, lecturers, partnerships, whatever, you know, really it's there for your resource. Uh, and that's kind of all I want to say. Plug on. Thanks. So I just really want to bring up what um, Jess was saying about us being self-reflective um, and it always exposing things. Um, I said in my speech that this discourse needs to go outside of this room and back to your own institutions and, and make it global. I think just everyone get talking, um, get exposing how access barriers exist, um, where you study and where you teach, um, try and bring light on them. Um, go and talk to each other at lunchtime, and, and let's keep this this the really important debate going um, about how we we break down those barriers um, and and tackle elitism in arts education. Thanks everyone for coming today and taking part in the debate. Thank you.